Jack N. Cole earned his bachelor's degree in English from the Catholic University of America in 1968. He received his M.A.T. degree in secondary education, English, and social studies in 1970 from Wayne State University. Dr. Cole served in numerous capacities in public education for over a decade. He worked in the computer industry for 15 years. In 2003, he joined the faculty of the Department of Secondary Education at Towson University. These are his reflections. Dr. Cole, thank you for sharing with us your thoughts about your own teacher preparation and your subsequent career in education and elsewhere. I think we should begin at the beginning, and so I will ask you to share with us your early social context, where you grew up, what kinds of career aspirations you were considering as you went through high school, and um, why you decided to be an English major when you got to college. I grew up on Army bases in a large number of places. I was an Army brat with a capital B. Um, Army brats, by the way, test better than a lot of other kids. They're more obnoxious and they take control of their environment. They have to fend for themselves, and I did. So the real stable thing in my life for years and years and years was I would walk into a classroom during the school year and there would be a teacher. So I saw a succession of teachers Catholic nuns, Christian brothers, um, lay people, um, citizens of the United States of America uh, who were teaching in public schools. And it always seemed like an interesting thing to do. When the class was over and they disappeared, I always wondered what happened to them, where they went <laughs> and what they did. I was uh, schooled by the Christian brothers in high school oh. at a school similar to Calvert Hall, sister school in Virginia at Bishop O'Connell and became really, really impressed with the brothers that I had teaching me, particularly English, history, and Latin. One day during my second year, Brother Maurice comes around and recruited me to join the order, told me that if I would gender enter the order to become a Christian brother, I could go to Amondale in Beltsville, Maryland, and they had an Olympic-sized swimming pool and they had an Olympic-sized gymnasium, and they had an apiary, and all sorts of other things, so I signed up. First day, I got to Amondale off of Route 1 in Beltsville. I walked out the back door of the place, and somebody handed me a shovel. I said, what's the shovel for? He said, it's work time. Come help us dig the foundations for the gymnasium. <laughs> So over the next two years, I built the gymnasium I ended up playing basketball in. Uh, the Christian Brothers is a teaching order of Catholic men. They're not priests, and they run Calvert Hall, St. John's College High School uh, in D.C., Bishop O'Connell down in Arlington, LaSalle Hall, and LaSalle College up in Philadelphia, and a number of other places around the country. Uh, got into my post-senior year after I'd graduated, decided that wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. But the teaching wasn't such a bad idea. Went to Catholic University after I got out of the Christian Brothers and signed up for my first year as a math major, hmm. which okay. considering that I hadn't taken trigonometry in high school, turned into two semesters of calculus and a grand total of four points out of 1,200 for the <laughs> year. Saw the light and switched into English. Uh -huh. Interesting. And what, um, what area of English? Were you a writing person or a lit person or a combination of the two? Medieval British drama. Interesting. And philosophy and theology. Uh -huh. And I took courses in the Department of Theater and I took courses in liberal arts. Tried to get a well-rounded education and took a large number of courses, of course, in philosophy and theology. Um, didn't do particularly well at any of them, but I had a good time. Yeah. Did you, as you were going through that degree, did you have a sense of what you might do once you got out? Nope. Uh-huh. Went to work with the Vista Volunteers, sophomore year, over break. Uh, spent four years doing things in the fraternity that 
probably don't need to be recounted <laughs> and got to senior year and the idea in my head was my girlfriend is going to Wayne State in Michigan to pursue her master's degree in nursing. Maybe I should follow along and see what the possibilities are. Uh huh. So you wound up at Wayne in, State. In beautiful Motor City, Detroit, <laughs> Michigan. And when you went, were you aware then that you would go into an MAT program? Did you go with that purpose in mind? No. I had previously interviewed for the MAT program at Temple and uh -huh. that didn't work out for a number of reasons. The MAT program um, at Wayne State was more or less accidental. I went to the English department and they were at least as impressed with me as the English department at Catholic U, which is to say not very, so I ended up <laughs> in the College of Education wandering around one fine day during the summer and saw a big cloud of smoke billowing from this office on the third floor. Okay. There were a hundred people lined up outside the office with papers in their hands. So I walked to the front of the line and walked in the door into this cloud of smoke and I saw papers stacked on the floor three or four feet deep covered with what looked like chemical equations. Turned out that was the department chair of secondary ed, a guy named Samuel Stone, and that was transformational linguistics. So. I sat down, we had a cigarette together while the other 100 people sat outside and we talked about what all this stuff was and I ended up signed up for the Masters in Teaching program. <laughs> True story. I believe it. Um, what did that program entail? 84 quarter hours of work in education, in psychology, uh, anthropology, linguistics, and architecture, pretty much anything I felt like taking, sociology, and it was a bunch of the most radical uh, people I could have ever conceptualized in my life. So they were the radical reformists that inhabited uh, Michigan at the time. Uh -huh. And can you talk a little bit about what that means? What that means is I taught myself how to teach. Uh -huh. I taught myself most of the courses. The most coherent course I had was analysis of teaching that involved the Flanders Amadon classroom interaction coding system uh, as well as one in transformational generative linguistics and another one that involved us creating our own philosophy of education. The methods courses were basically content free. Okay. You went and sat and listened and tried to stay awake and that was the end of the course and you got an A. There you go. Not very impressive. Hmm. During that same time, I was substitute teaching in the Detroit uh -huh. Public Schools, so I got to see inside of classrooms and inside uh -huh. of schools and observed that regardless of the circumstance, schools pretty much ran like schools and, uh -huh. and weren't the uh, violence ridden, ridden adventure movie scripted insanities that were projected to the general public. People were trying to do a good job and most of the kids that I saw were fairly serious about learning. But you did that on your own. You did that I had to eat. In, um, as a substitute teacher. You did this. So the program did not provide you with any opportunity to do that. I assume that at some point you must have done something akin to student teaching. My last semester was, thir was 12 credits of student teaching. But before that, before student teaching, you didn't go into schools at all? Not a tap. The only experience I had with Detroit was in my sociology course taught by a man named Archie Allen, who walked us in the first day, gave us a map of the city with 10 X's on it, said, come on back when you've seen all these different parts of Detroit. Hmm. And he was one of the best professors I ever had. What did you do with that information when you came back? Integrated it into what I thought and felt. I saw all the different parts of Detroit. Detroit looks a lot like Dresden did after the mm. fire bombing. It looks a lot like it does in today's movies. Alex Cross is set in Detroit. Um, Sixto Rodriguez about the singer that was bigger than John Lennon. Every place except in the U.S. is set in Detroit. Uh, there's a film called Detropia, which is a um, documentary about Detroit, just finished running in the, in the theaters. And the city is in decay, and on its back, the people there have, let's get back up and go make it work again spirit. So mm -hmm. I saw all of that and realized that as bad as things had gotten in Detroit, people were always hopeful for the future. 
So the kids at my high school came to learn, most of them. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you've got some that have other mm -hmm. agendas. Um, they were all pretty straight. There was uh, a serious look at academics. Uh, the school I taught in Northwestern High School, dead center in Detroit, at the corner of the two biggest streets in Detroit, and it was their flagship high school for downtown Detroit. Mm -hmm. I was one of three minority people in the school. Everybody else was African American. Um, I didn't know what white kids were like until I came to Harvard Grace and started teaching, and that was a culture shock. My students were serious. They were so into what they were doing in high school that in Detroit, they would walk around on the streets for two weeks after graduation wearing their caps and grounds because they were proud of graduating from high school. <laughs> you can't see that any place around here. No, isn't that interesting? Taught English, 9, 10, 11. Um, still remember some of the kids, wonder what happened to them. Mm -hmm. Every course. Friday, they would send somebody from Motown Records to practice in the gymnasium. <laughs> and the reason for that was they moved Dark Shadows, remember that? The vampire serial? Uh -huh. They moved that from 4.30 to 1 o'clock on television, and all of a sudden the girls all disappeared at 1 o'clock after lunch. So Barry <laughs> Gordy took to sending artists up to the high school to rehearse in the in the school so the kids would stick around to hear the music. Attendance went way up when he started doing I that. I guess so. What a great idea. Well, when you did your student teaching, did anybody come and observe you? Never or? saw one of them. I see. Not a one. They were afraid to go there. I rolled in my first day on my motorcycle <laughs> um, and stood in the parking lot with 100 kids standing around watching me trying to get the engine to stop. I took the key out, I turned the thing off, and it kept running. Come to find out the noise from behind me was a Detroit motorcycle cop writing me a ticket because I'd made an illegal left turn into the school and blown smoke in his face as Oops. I passed in front of him. So he wasn't very happy. So I got along real well with the kids. I was going to say, probably made you a folk hero of Maybe, sorts. maybe. We got along very well. Great bunch of kids. So you come out with your master's in the art of teaching, and where do you go next? Sent applications throughout Maryland, uh -huh. ended up with an interview and a job offer from Harford County in beautiful Havre de Grace mm -hmm. at the high school. Mm -hmm. Taught English, social studies, journalism, geography, um, and volleyball team, and drama. And so how were you feeling about that? It was you said that there was a degree of culture shock, that this was a different group of students altogether? Yep. It's a drug culture. A lot of the kids were drugged up. Um, a lot of them were, um, they called them river rats, the kids from Havre de Grace that had been there, their parents had been there forever. Uh -huh. They would disappear every year at the beginning of crabbing season because they went out on the boats. Um, nice kids. And then we had the kids coming in from the Proving Ground and the town kids and the Proving Ground kids. I didn't mix all that well, um, but we all got we all got along. But it was it was a culture shock. It took me a while to adjust to the rhythm of the classroom and to what people reacted to and what they didn't react to. So at some point, you make a decision that you're going to pursue a master's degree in literacy and reading. That's doctorate. A doctorate. I was minding my own business at the end of my second year, and in walked our supervisor, Big Ruth. Ruth Perkins, mm. she's pretty much a legend in the state, and fired the guy in the classroom to the left of me and fired the guy in the classroom to the right of me and looked at me and said, you ought to go to College Park and get a doctorate and learn something, which I did. And you did that full-time? Full-time for four years. Wow. Worked as a graduate assistant, worked at the study skills lab, worked in the College of Ed, worked for the department chair, mm -hmm. took courses. Well, tell me about um, your areas of emphasis when you were doing that doctorate. What, what did you intend to do professionally at the end of that degree? Where did you see yourself going? I was, it was a pretty research intensive bunch of people at the time. Uh -huh. um, they had two strengths, research and then schools. Uh -huh. And my intent was to go into reading research, cognitive uh -huh. science, uh, learning research, working with people to find out what learning was, how it operated, how you could affect it, how you could deal with it, and 
beyond that, I didn't really have any focus to my thinking. Uh -huh. Worked at the study skills lab for five years, learned a lot of what's been around since 1930s, and mostly disdained as remedial stuff, but mostly effective in the classroom. <laughs> and went to um, many research conferences. I did a psycholinguistics sequence over at Georgetown, went to the research conferences, went to the IRA conferences, did school type in service with teachers in the schools that were in and around Maryland. So I guess practicality and theory was were the two things on my mind. Mm -hmm. And as our friend Carl von Clausewitz, the uh, military theoretician of the 19th century said, theory is practice and that's something I learned doing it at that point. With degree in hand. Degree is reading education with minors in research methodology and evaluation and statistics. Um, senior, last year I was there, I was approached by the recently ex reading supervisor in Prince George's County, who was then the director of instruction, and she needed somebody to replace herself. So I got the job of coordinating supervisor of reading in Prince George's County. Wow. Wow. De design, develop, deploy, uh, implement, monitor, and maintain reading and language and learning programs for 176,000 kids and 7,600 teachers. Okay. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, didn't really know what I was doing, but I well, le learned quickly. You were there for a while. Yes. And so you must have learned something. Learned how to do hurry. it. Learned how to do it. Mm -hmm. Wish I'd have known then what I know now. I would have done it a whole lot better and a whole lot more effectively. Developed a comprehensive reading program curriculum, K-12. to Developed a program in learning strategies, K-12, to in mathematics, English, social studies, and English, social studies, mathematics. I have no Four idea. areas. Um, English, yeah. so English, social studies, math, and science and implemented that K-12, to got hauled in by the Nation at Risk study because I had done that and they interviewed me and cited the thing in their Nation at Risk documentation. Did content reading, K-12, to did the functional reading stuff when it came out. I did a whole lot of in-service for the 7,600 teachers. Got involved with the International Reading Association. I was state president at one point. I was chair of the um, legislative committee at mm -hmm. one point. So I did a whole lot of top to bottom, side to side work with administering and documenting and running the program. And what, um, what did you take away from that experience in terms of eff effective instruction this was not one of the questions. Oh, yeah, one, one, one of the things I was <laughs> reprimanded for was uh, spending time in schools. I used to go to schools and work with my friends' classes and do stuff like memory, note-taking, listening, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot about kids in a large major school system. I learned that when you have a system that big that was integrated the year I graduated from high school. Uh -huh. I graduated in Beltsville from a small institute. It's a normal school. Christian Brothers, but at that time they took the Prince George's County Public and the Prince George's County Consolidated School Systems, put them together, and then started bussing kids right. across the Beltway up and down. I found out that when I got there later on, and the choice got to be let's go from having 25, 30 basal readers in an elementary school, they were going to allow us to select two. So I developed committees of a couple hundred people. We had all of the publishers come in and show us their wares, and they settled on two of them, a Houghton Mifflin and a Scott Forsman, which were the Dick and Jane readers that mm -hmm. many of us remember from elementary school. Mm -hmm. Turns out that the teachers outside the Beltway selected the Houghton Mifflin, by and large, and the teachers inside the Beltway selected the Scott Forsman, because really? those kids can't handle the Houghton Mifflin. And guess which kids were aware, predominantly speaking? Mm -hmm. That got on my nerves. 
I, because when you deprive kids of the opportunity to have the best of the best, mm -hmm. you're systematically destroying their education and their brains and their life prospects. So one of the things I took away from there was, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons I decided to leave. I had done everything I thought I would be able to do mm -hmm. and got itchy feet. I also took away that no matter how bad school systems are cracked down to be by the media and by the public, they're full of men and women that are breaking their backs, doing the best job they possibly can, looking for any way they can to do a better job and to have what they do have a greater effect with their students. And they're also full of a large number of students that are serious about learning. I took that away with me. Mm -hmm. Also, um, over the years, I've evolved a socio-political historical analysis that leads me to believe that our schools are in the process of morphing into something else and entirely different. And much of it is out of the controls of the people that run the school. And what it's going to be will be very, very exciting and much better for the human psyche and for the development of our young people. And it will come to pass because of individuals who decide they're going to pioneer little tiny pieces of it and get from zero to wherever we end up over the course of time. Learned that at Wayne State. I ran into a fellow named William Carlos Williams historian, you heard of him, mm -hmm. and his theory about manifest destiny mm -hmm. wasn't so much that we were out there to win the world in the name of God and whatever church was behind us, but manifest destiny was people went across the continent going another hundred yards at a time. And by the time the century was up, we'd gone all the way across the continent, but nobody was thinking about manifest destiny except the politicians, the little farmer, the little rancher, the little um, sheep herder, whoever, was just thinking about making life a little tiny bit better by going just a little bit further along whatever developmental path it is. And I think that's where schooling is headed. Hmm. But you decided to take a break. Yeah, I went to work for a software company because I was really, really into software. My f I had bought a computer. Well, sure. I had bought a computer, and I found that I was able to outproduce my three secretaries <laughs> in an hour. It would take them a week to do what I could do in an hour. Uh -huh. And I got itchy feet. Uh -huh. And so I wanted to go into the world of software and see what was going on out there in terms of computers and well, things like that. This would have been very early then, not only in your introduction to computers and software, but everybody's. Oh, yeah. So that was an exciting time to sort of take that leap and go into that field. And that's when I was president of the State Reading Association. Uh -huh. I got them their first computer, which they use for all the conferences. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm sure it's a new, different computer than it was <laughs> then. And um, I became engaged with the State Department of Education Principals Academy, writing mm -hmm. and conducting the Principals Academies in Technology and Gender Equity, where we found out that um, although social justice has always been an issue of mine, it was also like spitting into a hurricane. Mm. People won't do stuff because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. People will do stuff if it's profitable, which is why the diversity movement's gotten as far as it has. And people will do it if it makes sense to them or makes their lives easier. So we approach gender equity from the standpoint of if you use the technology to make life easier at the school, it'll be a more equitable environment. So they were putting girls into classes that typically had only boys. They were putting boys into classes that were typically only for girls. One of the supervisors here in Baltimore County took about a million and a half books away from a poor high school and gave them to a, a high school that was classified as rich because for years the poor school had gotten all these resources it couldn't use. So they were stacking up and the rich high school was using 10 and 15 year old textbooks. So he redressed that imbalance which sounds like a strange imbalance to have, but things got weird back during the 80s and the 90s. Um, did about eight years worth of those principals academies, and the men and women in there were excited by the hardware and the software, loved to have the time to play with the toys, and came up with ways of using them that helped balance things out in their schools to the benefit of everybody. It was like, if you wanna make Title IX happy, or if you want to make Title IX work without a bunch of grumbling, figure out a way to make it 
less work rather than more work. Yeah. I mean, principals used to obsess over scheduling. Mm -hmm. All summer they'd work on these schedules mm -hmm. by hand and the superintendent would come in in August and say, well, now do this and it's just do redo your schedules. It's no big deal. And they'd all be pounding their heads on the tables. Now you push a button and things sort out in you know, under 30 seconds. So when the computers got into the principal hands, they started doing incredibly smart stuff with them. And they were tinkerers. They, were, they did stuff they weren't supposed to do. Computers not designed to do that, but they made it work. So yeah, I was kind of an early adopter yes. in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. And then I ended up one day teaching a software program and a bunch of federal guys came through from Healthcare Financing Administration. They had to do a national network for all of the health of the Blue Crosses and Blue Shields to bring their information into Baltimore and look at the cost data for administration. And they wanted to know if I could do them the network. And I said, yep. So for a couple of years, I developed the Medicare automated network over at HICFA here in, off, it was used to be off of uh, Security Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Now it's way out Security Boulevard. It's a large castle. So that evolved from the first, and all the way along I was training, I was developing things, and I was involved with education at the community college level, local level, and through the State Department of Education. So you really didn't go away. It's all the same career. Yeah. I just took a turn. Yes. Did a little meander and... It all fit together. Uh-huh. So when did you get involved in higher education? And in what capacity? Let's see. After all of that, I ended up working with the Community Learning Information Network, which was the National Guard's distributed network of areas around the country where people could go and take anything they wanted to on the computer. Uh -huh. That disappeared the day after 9-11 mm -hmm. because it had to be secure and there was no way for it to be secure. 9-11, mm -hmm. I stood in my office and watched the smoke rising from the Pentagon. I was down on K Street working at that point. Mm -hmm. So eventually I ended up working for a consulting firm, mm -hmm. Community um, Eris. And at Eris were people you might have run into in your travels, Sandra Crowley and Larry Nash, who were pretty well known at the State Department for many, many years for um, the state, tech, state standards and technology assistance programs, where they took the state standards into schools and they worked mm -hmm. with them. And so I worked with them as a management organizational change and diversity consultant for several years. Um, one day when I was working I was at the power company doing diversity training. Um, Larry walked in. He said, how would you like to teach at Hopkins, huh? I said, sure, why not? Sounds like fun. So I did up my CV for them. He took it over to Hopkins and showed it to the people there. And when they stopped laughing, I got a phone call to go teach marketing. Marketing? I said, marketed computers, I'd marketed software, I'd marketed components. I'd done, been a marketing representative for a company called Prodigy mm -hmm. that was like America Online for a good long time. Mm -hmm. So I ended up there teaching marketing and then I got to teach adult learning and then I got to teach organization management in technology situations. And this is all at situations. Hopkins? It's all at Hopkins. Taught there for about 10 years. Uh -huh. um, and one day I was minding my own business and Lynn comes in and says, they need somebody to teach a reading course over at Towson. And she was already at Towson. She'd been there several years at that uh -huh. point. So I met, re met Gloria Newbert. Uh -huh. I had known Gloria at College Park when she was, we Where? did our degrees at the same time. Uh -huh. So I, the circle came around and ended up back here working Isn't in secondary ed. So, and what kinds of things have you done in your position here? What things? Bunch of stuff. Um, worked with the Multicultural Committee, taught the diversity course, teaching the Urban Perspectives course, which is a similar kind of thing that's going on now, taught methods courses, taught the reading course, taught the how to teach course, the principles course, um, started a research project about learning that's kind of what we're doing here, only the topic is what do you do when you learn, and I'm slicing the population by age 
So what do 20-somethings do when they set out to learn? What do 30-somethings, 40-somethings, 50-somethings? Mm -hmm. And the answers are different, mm -hmm. very different. I'm doing a development of a platform for my teaching because I've decided that teaching isn't only what you do in your classroom, it's what you do in your career. And the far wall of my classroom is somewhere in Shanghai or beyond. Everything you do that fits your mission as a teacher can be broadcast or can connect with human beings in lots of different places in lots of different ways. And it should be possible to think of yourself as a content management system so something I develop turns up on a website, on Twitter, as a monograph, at a presentation, as a piece of a research project. And that's my current project. That's one of the things I'll be talking about in January at the technology conference over in the college. So basically, since I've been here, I've been developing ideas like that, trying them out in my classroom, floating them with students and staff, and basically just trying to stay alert and do more. One of the things that you have been um, very much involved in is our partnership with China mm -hmm. in terms of preparing post, I don't know how to say it, leadership candidates at the master's degree level. Tell us about that involvement. What, how did that come to pass? About eight years ago, they. Um, Jim Lawler and Barbara, I forget her last name, Barbara Ellis, God bless them, were putting together the, I think the second year of the uh -huh. China project, and they had an opening in an area where I felt fairly comfortable teaching, and so they signed me up to go over there and teach the final course in the master's program to the second cohort of teachers in that program, and I went and I went back, and I went back, and I went back. <laughs> Love China. What, what drew you back for a number of years? China is like a big hardware store. <laughs> it's like Disneyland. It's <laughs> different place. Uh, historically, it's different. Culturally, it's different. There's always something more to see. It's just exciting. There really are no rules for, mm -hmm. for much of anything, and so for someone in my position, it's just a wonderful environment to go and try new things out and learn new things and see how people think. Um, same thing as when I went to Detroit, same thing as when I went to Harvard or Grace. They're just people. And the, the big learning involved is the people everywhere are just like people everywhere. Same thing I discovered when the year I went to the Million Man March. I was the only pale face I saw at the Million Man March all day. Uh, and nobody noticed it. It was not a matter of any discussion. It was just a bunch of guys that were there for a common purpose, and mm -hmm. everybody took that seriously. So what I love about China, it's just fascinating. And are the, stu are the students different? Oh, God, yes. How so? The Chinese people relate to their culture with great reverence, they relate to their government with great fear and trembling. They tend to stay in a groove that they're in because it's a safe place to be and it's difficult to get them to deviate from what has been working successfully for them for about 6,000 years. Um, the concept of creativity is much respected and much admired and much misunderstood there. To get them to do something different is like blowing rocks apart with dynamite. It's very, very difficult to move that. That culture's been in place for 6,000 years. Um, what they have there now is an emperor system, only instead of the emperor, it's a joint committee of, um, what do they used to call them? Warlords. Each of the main characters in the Chinese government has certain industries that are under control, under his or her control, and the whole place functions like an oligop oligopoly. Um, nobody really believes in communism anymore, but everybody knows the language that you speak in order to survive and prosper. Everybody knows that belonging to the party is the way to get promoted. 
uh, and it's not easy to get a membership in the Communist Party. Mm. It's a difficult thing. It's worse than um, Masons. And there's, a, there's a lot to it. So they're just, and, and they're real eager and open to what goes on here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. They have a high regard for us at the same time as they see some of the downsides of what we have going, the relative openness and um, disregard for authority here uh -huh. is something that they find refreshing. Uh -huh. So they're looking at going in this direction with their schooling and their culture at the same time as we're looking at going in that direction <laughs> with our schooling and our culture. So it's just a fascinating place. Uh -huh. well, it helps me think. Uh -huh. And it's warm most of the year. There you go. You have had a, a varied experience, um, and you've been involved in education and teaching for a couple of decades. Forty. Forty years. Okay. Um, and you certainly have been involved in teacher education on different continents. And this leads us to the, my very long question, which is essentially, with all that experience, what do you see as um, the essential ingredients in a successful teacher education program? What needs to be there? Close connection to what happens in schools. Okay. Without the kind of doctrinaire meta structures for thinking that guide what you see. I think we need to take a real look at what goes on in environments that we call learning. We need to understand that the assumptions that are in place in learning situations are on all sides so that we have our so-called students trained to react in certain ways when we do certain things, unconscious. So when you're in a class and you ask a question, the behaviors you see are some of them lower their eyes if they don't want to answer. Some of them do this when they don't want to answer. Some of them do direct eye contact and those are the ones that you think maybe I can call on, maybe they're there. Those kinds of unconscious behaviors rule a lot of what happens in schools. And we need to take another look at what's really going on with our learners to see what kind of directions we can move them in. Teaching is a combination of acting. It's a combination of sales. It's a combination of psychology. And it's a relationship type of a business. And I think we need to incorporate more of those components in what we do with the people we're putting out as teachers so that they have a better chance to engage with folks who are becoming um, increasingly disaffected, increasingly driven by assumptions that you need to do 27 activities to get into the right college, increasingly driven by the feeling that if they teach it to me in a school, it's the stuff that I need to learn, um, increasingly driven by the unexamined assumption that you're here this year, you're here next year, you're here the year following, when people don't really follow that kind of a developmental course. We also need to map out the development of human beings from cradle to grave. We have Piaget, we have Maslow, we have um, Howard Gardner, we have a bunch of people that have taken looks at the landscape, but their generalizations break down very, very quickly when you get a group of people together and start interacting with them. And we need to develop our tools for working with people so that they serve us better than they have in the past. I use Excel for a grade book. Mm -hmm. I know where every one of my students happens to be at the end of every interaction. I have their numbers stored and calculated automatically. I have their grade calculated automatically. I have their learning predilections. I have their learning strategies. I have 
their life circumstances, I have their health conditions listed so I know if I hear from Kim today and she's not going to come and it's day five and it's because she had mono for three days, they released her to come back and her father died, so that's two more days she's going to be out, that she's not a goofball. That she's a serious learner and I need to adjust my expectations to move her on through the teacher preparation curriculum so that she can be a good teacher rather than get the spotlight shined on her and have her identified as a loser because all of a sudden her life fell apart. I think that we need to build in an element of knowing what change is societally, organizationally, and in a, within a school and to teach our students the tools that they can use in order to bring changes about in the structures in which they're embedded. There's a saying in the federal government, put a good person into a lousy system and the system wins every time. Mm -hmm. Yet we know from history that you can put six committed people into a system and they can make a change. Six parents brought us the Athey Bill in Anne Arundel County, it led to statewide testing and reading and math at grades three, five, and seven. Five parents. They coordinated their efforts. It would take a minimum effort on the part of five teachers in a school to bring about the kind of changes in a school that would be more beneficial for both the little people and the big people involved. We need to teach our students that they are not the passive recipients of guidance from the powers that be, that they are independent practitioners and responsible for bringing about the best learning environment that they possibly can. And at the point where they don't think they can, they can do what I did, which is go somewhere else. The system did not crumble because I left Prince George's County. All those men and women kept working real hard and all those kids kept learning. Uh, didn't have me there to help them anymore, but I had other fish to fry. Leaving a position in education isn't like dying. Where do you think they go after five to seven years? They leave. Where do they go? Wouldn't it be much nicer if they expected, after five to seven years, you'd be ready for something else? And oh, here are 60 other places that you can work with a degree and training in education mm -hmm. where they want to have you because mm -hmm. you're smart, you work, if they pay you, you do a good job, you can speak and think clearly, and you're generally positive and upbeat. Teachers are a great find for training, corporations, organizations, the military, libraries, community colleges. And just because you go into a high school for five years and then go somewhere else, it's not that we shot you or that you've died, it's that you've evolved into something else. Why not set that expectation at the beginning? Mm -hmm. Our two years in the classroom, my time in Detroit, my teaching in the prison when I was teaching there all prepared me for other things. Mm -hmm. Would I want to be a lifer teaching in the Maryland State Correction System? Probably not. I would get bored after a brief period of time. I wouldn't be any good for them and they wouldn't be any good for me. Would I want to stay out of high school for 20 years? Some people, the answer to that one is yeah. If I'm here for 20 years, I have 20 different years mm -hmm. and I get 20 kinds of better. Other people stay for 20 years, they have the first year 20 times. They would be better off realizing that and doing some of that other time working for the Girl Scouts, training scout leaders, working for a bank, training people that work in banks, working for the Marine Corps, helping people learn to throw hand grenades accurately or whatever it is that they do with them these days. So I think all of those components need to be pre-thought and built in, and what has, what has to happen is more outliers have to be brought into the system and get a listen. Because yeah. if you're in a system for 10 years, what you know is what's in the system. And as good as that is, it's always better to bring in ideas from the outside that can be fused with what's already working to create something that works a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anything that we haven't talked about? I see some notes. Have we kind of had an opportunity to... You asked the best questions I've ever had asked. Nobody in my life have, has ever asked me questions this good. Do you know that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And you know what Lynn told me? What? Same thing. <laughs> you really did a beautiful job with this. 
Um, I know we have that final question, which is, oh, and we sort of got into my word choice on this one, but you know I'm going to ask it, which is, what would you share? What would you say? Notice my careful word choice here to an individual at whatever age who is considering a career or considering um, working as a classroom teacher? I'd give them a rubber fish <laughs> okay. and I'd give them a copy of Professor Agassiz and the Fish like I do in my first course uh -huh. where a kid wants to learn entomology goes to the number one naturalist in the century, a guy named Louis Agassiz, and asks, and Agassiz hands him not a bug but a fish, uh -huh. and the story is about how this kid learns everything he possibly can about the fish, uh -huh. and the end of the story is something that's been in front of him the whole time but he hasn't seen, and that's what learning is when you start hopping from the particular to the general. He discovers that vertebrates are bilaterally symmetrical. You got a right hand, you got a left hand. Uh -huh. And then I would say, what you need to do is to learn every single detail about every single thing involved in this profession that you have chosen. Money isn't the most important thing in the world in education, but it's a lot like oxygen. You need it to continue to exist. Money doesn't make good education. Good teaching makes good education. You need to learn to do that. Half of what you know today is obsolete. The other half will go obsolete in five years. You need to learn how to keep refreshing your store of wisdom and knowledge learn how the system works so that you can participate in it, learn how to create change so you can cause it to change, and look at the people that get spit out by the system and the things that happen to them. Um, Jonathan Livingston Seagull's son, a guy named James Bach, wrote a book called The Buccaneer Scholar. He got spit out by the system. He ended up vice president of creativity at Microsoft and vice president of systems design at Apple with out of high school diploma. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, a lot of people that got spit out sideways by the systems we use to keep people moving along in our society have a lot to teach us about what it is that we can do differently, what it is that we can do to make life better for everybody, and what it is we can do for the people that are in those classrooms moving along one classroom a year to help them blossom and become the kind of obnoxious, obstreperous, I want to do it this way, <laughs> low regard for authority, people that constitute good citizens of these United States. Because we aren't in business to create good Germans. We aren't in business to create good Chinese. Um, if we were in business to create good Canadians, we'd probably be better off. But the fact of the matter is that what you need to do is learn to enjoy the creative, evolving, totally different side of things that are going to present themselves to you every single day. And if you can't enjoy doing it, go someplace else, because this isn't going to be any fun. And if it's not fun, don't do it. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. I appreciate being included. You're welcome. Being somewhat of an outlier. <laughs> We're, we like outliers around here. At least some of us do. It's good to have a few lunatics running loose. Absolutely. They're integral. Because the way the systems are going, systems exist to perpetuate themselves, which is healthy. I mean, that's why we developed them. Once we came out of the woods and the jungles, we put systems together so people would survive. Uh -huh. That created civilization. Uh -huh. um, so they exist to perpetuate themselves and they, they exist to grow. And those are only healthy up to a point. At some point, all the, they should all be dismembered and start afresh. And the ones we're enmeshed in are no different. Public ed is going to morph into a combination of places where people go for various purposes and other places in industry and government and out in the community where people go to continue their learning and to flourish as human beings. That's inevitable, it's in process, and there's not a darn thing anybody can do to stop it. And that's what we shall see over the next hundred years. Mm -hmm. And that's where I want to be. Great. So. Thanks.
Nice pedestal. 